lot of people, you know, wonder why, you know, certain things are they are the way they are today. And they aren't taught or haven't, you know, as, as adults taken the time to, you know, research why these things are the way they are today because of all the things that have happened in the past. Yeah. And you can't fix a problem if you don't understand what led to the problem and just admit that there is a problem. Hey everyone, welcome to the Sugar Daddy Podcast. I'm Jessica. And I'm Brandon. And we're the Norwoods, a husband and wife team here to demystify the realm of dollars so it all makes sense while giving you a glimpse into our relationship with money and each other. We are so glad you're here. Let's get started. Our content is intended to be used and must be used for informational purposes only. It is very important to do your own analysis before making any investment based upon your own personal circumstances. You should take independent financial advice from a licensed professional in connection with or independently research and verify any information you find in our podcast and wish to rely upon whether for the purpose of making an investment decision or otherwise. Hey, babe. What are we talking about today? With February being Black History Month, we wanted to focus on topics within finance that, you know, revolve around and affect Black Americans. So today, what we're really going to focus on is the racial wealth gap. I love it. Happy Black History Month. Yes. Happy Black History Month. As I said before, I'm not going to say anything about it being the shortest month. But then you <laughs> but always then I... <laughs> say something about it being the shortest month. Yes. But... Even though you're not saying anything yes, about yes. it being the shortest month. Yeah. You did that very well. <laughs> Good plug, honey. <laughs> well, I think um, the racial wealth gap and land ownership discrimination is a really big topic. What we're really trying to accomplish this month is education around the history of black Americans and how it has impacted finance and wealth for black Americans today, right? Yes. So learning from our past and applying that to how we are currently in the present and bringing an awareness to topics that are not often talked about, certainly aren't taught in school, maybe in college, if you're actively seeking courses yeah, on very, very specific courses. Not right. Any. But you know, we're, I mean, this is not anything that we would have learned in middle school or high school. So unless you're actively seeking out this information, it could be new to you, right? Um, it could be something that maybe you've heard about, but haven't researched. So what we're trying to do really is bring an awareness to some of these critical historical, I don't know what to call them, events, occurrences, occurrences, occurrences. systemic. Yeah. I mean, so we're, we're trying to build awareness. We want to help educate our listeners on the history of black America, how it relates to finance and really help get people's wheels turning. So some of these conversations, you know, might be a little bit heavier than our normal light topics, right? This is not our Enneagram episode and that's okay, but we hope that it sparks curiosity and interest and encourages you to take the next step in learning a little bit more about black America, black history and celebrate black culture as it is today. I think unfortunately in America and it happens in other countries, but I would say America is a major um, offender of it is that, they don't properly address the negative things that they've done throughout history. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're growing, we don't take ownership. Yeah, we don't take ownership. Americans don't take ownership you know, for growing our past. up. You know, when we in, in school, we don't learn about a lot of the atrocities that have occurred, and these atrocities directly affect you know members of those groups that they occur to today. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, wonder why you know certain things are they are the way they are today, and they aren't taught or haven't, you know, as, as adults taken the time to, you know, research why these things are the way they are today because of all the things that have happened in the past. Yeah. And you can't fix a problem if you don't understand what led to the problem and just admit that there is a problem. Yeah. That's the, the first step of fixing you a can't, problem. If you can't even communicate 
and acknowledge that there is an issue that's in any part of life, right? Then how are you going to fix it? Exactly. Whereas you go to other countries, you know, I mean, you can visit Holocaust museums all over Europe. You can visit, I mean, we went to a beautiful museum in Poland that highlighted, you know, centuries of Polish past and and the, and the oppression. Yeah. The oppression that they've gone through as a people and why it's, you know, essentially turned them into the people that they are today. And again, it's centered and it's I mean, part of the culture and it's not like swept under the rug. I think the easiest um, and most obvious example is Germany. Yeah. You know, look at what happened, you know, World War Two, World War One and World War Two and the steps and strides that that country has taken and continues to take to make right for the wrongs that they did and address them mm-hmm. and take hit head on. Right. We Absolutely. don't do that in the United States. <laughs> no. I mean, you can go to Washington, D.C., and now you can, you know, they have a Holocaust museum, and you can visit the Museum of African uh, History. Which was just created a few years ago. <laughs> right. But it's not ingrained in our DNA as a, as a country, right? Yeah. I think our DNA as a country of America, of Americans, is, well, let's get over it. It happened so long ago. But the reality is... It didn't happen so long ago. We have family members who went to segregated elementary schools. We have family members who had to go to movie theaters certain days of the week because they have melanin in their skin, right? It is not, oh, let's get over it. The image of the young black girl, you know, helping to integrate schools in the South, Ruby Bridges, She's the same age as my mother. Right. <laughs> She's Insane. not some 90 year old woman. She's the same age right. as my mother. And even <laughs> if she was a 90 year old woman, like that means it wasn't that long ago. No. But yeah, the fact that she's the same age as her parents. I mean, you know, when you put things in perspective like that, I think that's what's eye opening because mm-hmm. there are still, unfortunately, so many people who want to say or do go around and say it was so long ago. Let's just get over it. And that's just. A, stop saying that, and B, it wasn't that long ago. And so because it wasn't that long ago, these harmful things that have happened and that were allowed to happen to black Americans is still very much feeding into today's society and the lived experiences of black Americans. And to preface, you know, the conversations we're going to have this month are not meant to make anyone feel bad. Right. This is not the focus of this. This is an educational aspect so that you understand what has led to these issues. Right. And once you, I think, have a better understanding of what has led to these these issues, that starts to open the door for the conversation of what we can do to move forward to fix them. Yeah. So this is not the time to be fragile and defensive or to, you know, hit next (laughs) on, (laughs) on this episode or to cancel out and hit the X. This is really a time... To listen and learn and to hopefully feel challenged in your current state of knowledge and maybe to explore future resources to help you understand a little bit more about the history if it's not something that you've dug into in the past. We're not trying to make anybody feel bad. And, you know, I think there's this like sense of guilt that people often have. And like, yes, we understand that just because you're a white person you it doesn't mean that you're racist. It doesn't mean that your family, you know, were slave owners or that you owe us anything. But sure. at this stage, what we're looking for is for people to grow in their knowledge and in their understanding of how the United States was built and how how we're really built and not how, you know, textbooks from when we were kids say it was built that and how that has fed into how we live today and the things that are still occurring. Cause we even just had a very recent experience and we'll get into it um, of things that white people don't have to consider. Right. We just had an, well, I'll just get into it now and then we'll segue. We just had an appraisal done of our home. We're closing on our new house, selling our current house. And we wanted to make sure that there were no traces of us being a Brown family in our house for when the appraiser came And that's really sad. And if you're a white person listening to this and you're like, what's that about? That seems dramatic. Well, guess what? Do a quick Google search and you will quickly learn that brown families in 2022, in 2023, are still getting 
their houses and their homes appraised for a ridiculously amount less. I know that's a weird sentence. I said that wrong. (laughs) But we are getting our homes appraised for less than white families. And so it is important for us as a brown family in the United States to remove our brownness so that we hopefully are not going to be essentially discriminated against, right? Yeah, and I'm not saying that this is happens all the time, but it does occur. So it's something that we have we to wanted think to mitigate. About. So literally we made sure that we weren't going to be here. And essentially Justin and I walked through and basically we're like, hey, do we see anything sticking out that shows what our race is? Right. You know, we t- obviously our pictures were already taken down, but we wanted to make sure that the house was as neutral as possible. But we've also had friends who, you know, during COVID and prior to when interest rates were dropping and they were refinancing their homes, they did the same thing. Like, I mean, I I can think of a person who specifically asked their friends for their white friends for a couple of pictures to put up on the mantle to say, hey, a white family lives here. So this is not an isolated right. incident or an isolated mind mindset. And it's also not something where, you know, I hope people listening now are not like rolling their eyes like, oh, this is so dramatic and that's so unnecessary. But it is necessary. And that's the sad part. And that's the sad part. And so we wanted to make sure that we had the best leg up and that we took out our brownness. I mean, Brandon was like, uh, well, if they look under the cabinets, you know, they'll see all your hair products. And okay, like if you're going to go that far, then it is what it is. But that outward, you know, we took down the pictures, we didn't have anything um, obviously showing that we are a brown family living here. And we just wanted to make sure that our appraisal hopefully comes back fair. Yeah, and this is not to say that like, like I said, we didn't interact, we haven't had any interactions that make us think that this was the you know was going to occur Mm -hmm. but the thing is in this in this scenario the way you have to think about it is that you never you're not going into a situation thinking that someone is racist no you're just going into a situation not knowing what it may be so you're kind of like preparing preparing yourself yourself for what could happen and but not necessarily saying that this is going to occur yeah exactly well let's get into what the racial wealth gap is and where it came from and what we need to know So the term racial wealth gap refers to the disparity in assets of a typical household across race and ethnicity. And there is a huge gap when it comes to comparing, you know, white families, you know, the average median wealth of a white family compared to a black family. So, you know, um, the average median wealth of a white family currently is around one hundred and seventy one thousand dollars. Now, in comparison, the average median wealth for a black family is seventeen thousand six hundred. I'm sorry, we're missing some numbers there. So let me repeat it again. Yeah. For the white family, one hundred and seventy one thousand dollars is the median wealth compared to a black family. That's seventeen thousand six hundred. And when we say wealth, this is not income. No, this is asset. Correct. So one hundred and seventy one thousand for a white family compared to seventeen thousand. Yes, that's a tenth. It's, I mean, I know I'm bad at math, but it's a dramatic amount. Yes. Right. It's about a tenth. And the thing is, is that the crazy part is, is that you would think maybe during, you know, now that gap is decreasing. It's not. It's actually increasing. And it has been increasing since uh, post uh, civil rights area, civil rights era in the 1960s. So it's almost as if, you know, we're going to push towards, you know, equality has caused more inequality. I want to say I'm surprised by that. I'm not. But obviously I'm not. (laughs) Unfortunately, I'm not. Like, I'm not, I'm not a pessimist, but I'm also, you know, a realist with hopes of some of the ideas I think may or be occurring that we can get past them with the hopes of that. Mm -hmm. But I also do have to operate in the idea of what real life is. I can't live in a fantasy world. Right. No rose colored glasses. So wealth in most cases is tied back to land and or real estate. Correct. Right. Two thirds for the average household, um, two thirds of their wealth is real estate. Yeah. So if you are not able to access real estate and purchase real estate, you are missing. You're already missing out right right off the bat. Two thirds, the largest Mm -hmm. percentage of what attributes to wealth accumulation. 
So when I see 171,000 for a white family and 17,000 for a black family, my immediate thought is home ownership versus non home ownership. Correct. And that's, that and that's the way to think about it. Okay. How did we get to that huge disparity? Well, I'm going to kind of fast forward through, you know, certain things because I'm not going we to necessarily have. talk about. <laughs> this is not a Netflix documentary. <laughs> hundreds of years of slavery. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about that. Yeah. I'm going to start at, um, you know, towards the end of slavery and post slavery. Okay. So just to kind of get a context of like, you know, the value of that was placed upon slaves as a whole, approximately um, in 1815, 1853, while slavery was still going on, the value of the stock of slaves was worth approximately $3 billion at that time. Wow. If you were to equate that into today's dollars in 2000, you know, close as well, as close as today is like 2018, um, that'd be $83 billion. Wow. That's a All lot. Right? And the, like once again, these are slaves. So these are mm-hmm. quote unquote property of their owners. They are not getting paid for this work once again. Right. All right. So you have, um, Slavery abolished. And what they ended up doing was, is that there was obviously a plan to try and um, ease uh, former slaves into freedom now. Mm -hmm. So in 1865, um, the U.S. government got together 20 black leaders and they had discussions with them as far as what do they think would be needed by the black community in order to help with this transition into freedom? 20. Can I just say, (laughs) talk about freaking tokenism. Like when you're the only black person in the room and it's like, Oh, well, what do you think? What do, what do black people think about this? You got to think too, at this time that it was, one this substantially lower of number, course. and then also education, education, the disparities there and stuff like that. So you only had a certain right. number of people that you could actually getting really people have an into idea. One room, I know, but it just twenty. Let's ask twenty black people. It wasn't twenty black people. It was twenty black leaders. So okay. these were black leaders. These weren't just random. But people. But the number twenty is what I'm talking about. Like, let me ask twenty people their well, opinions mm-hmm. on what we need to do after hundreds of years of slavery. Well, let's- <laughs> Okay. okay, I know. I just had a moment because that's absolutely ridiculous. Please proceed. Well, once they gathered the 20 black leaders, they unanimously said that land ownership was one of the main things that they needed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So fair. They took hundreds of thousands of acres and set aside um, those to be distributed at a maximum of 40 acres towards free black slaves. So now that's, that's where, where the, the term 40 acres and the mule comes from. Okay. It was the idea of what was going to be given to freed slaves in order to help them transition into, you know, freedom, free life. All right. So Lincoln goes ahead and signs the bill and makes it official that this is going to occur. And then he gets assassinated. And this is where history completely changed Mm. as far as what could possibly be today and what is. When Lincoln was assassinated a few weeks later, his successor, Andrew Johnson, reversed course. He completely eliminated the plan. Dang you, Andrew. So even some individuals who actually had received uh, received uh, uh, land. land through this um, bill ended up having it taken away. Wow. So we were that. I mean, that could have been the game changer. Yeah. I mean, we know that there are so many other things that have occurred in history, right, where black Americans were paving their way and trying to turn things around working on becoming successful landowners, business owners, Black Wall Street. There's so many stories that you hear and then, you know, it gets burned down. It, I mean, who knows what could have happened, right? But that was clearly the turning point. Yeah, the idea of freeing the, freeing slaves was extremely progressive, obviously, during that time period. Right. And then even more progressive on top of that was the idea that you're going to free them and, and then give them, give them land. land. Right. So that idea was not popular, which is why Andrew Johnson went ahead and reversed course. Mm. And the sad part is, is that not even just the sad part, the crazy part in my mind is that, you know, there's even documentation, you know, up to only a year after slavery ended where you have Andrew Johnson complaining about, quote unquote, discrimination against the white man. For these slaves being free and maybe having access to land. Now, imagine being enslaved for hundreds of years. And you've not even been free for a year. And, and then, then you other, have to hear your about, counter, white counterpart is complaining about them being discriminated against. We're going to put that in the white fragility box. Like, come on. Is there I mean, even now, right, you're looking if you watch even an ounce of the news once a week, what do you see most white men 
throwing tantrums like a three-year-old in the grocery store not getting a candy bar, but then the sentiment is still, women shouldn't be in politics because we're too emotional. All I see is emotional men on my television. Yeah. <laughs> throwing tantrums, being babies, not being able to control their tempers. There are a lot of White um, male fragility is what that is. And it's, 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 it's just crazy to think, you know, that, you know, if... Lincoln wasn't assassinated, how different things could have possibly been. Right. But, you know, wow. throughout history, it's shown that, like, when you are someone ahead of your times, you don't live long. For several mm-hmm. instances of that, you know? Yeah. So the crazy thing is, is that, you know, they decide to reverse course, reverse course and not provide this land to free slaves. But however, you know, the 250 years worth of slavery that had occurred and the money and income that was made off of that, the wealth that was created up, up, up mm-hmm. from that. White people were allowed to keep. Shocker. You know? (laughs) Wow. That is mind-blowing. And I think you mentioned that the land that had kind of been divvied out or, like, was accounted for was then taken back. Yeah, they had already started to give some of it out. Mm -hmm. Like the student loan forgiveness. Once they recourse. And then they took it back. Changed it, they took it back. Yeah. All right? Wow. And not being able to, you know, you know, have land was the main way it's still one of the main ways as we i said before it's two-thirds of you know people's wealth mm-hmm. not being able to have access to that right completely sets you behind now you were already set behind you know 250 years of not being able to do anything because you were not even counted as a whole person you were three-fifths of a person right and you were somebody else's property now imagine and your children that were born into that life were somebody else's yes. property and yeah and I do want to make some clarifications here because I've heard some people say things that, you know, kind of try to diminish what slavery was for black Americans. Mm-hmm. So I've heard people say, oh, you know, the Irish were slaves also. No, they weren't. The Irish Talk were indentured it. servants. That's And different. that's completely different. Yeah. The slavery that you're occurred. Like paying off a debt. Yeah. The, yeah. You could. And you then could, you're free. You could be free. But you also you weren't necessarily time. specific to having to stay there even like. On their property 24 7. Right. Being stripped of your family's name. <laughs> your family and wasn't born into indentured ex- servitude. Exactly. It's completely different. And when you're starting to make comparisons like that, you're diminishing the severity of what um, black American slavery was. Right. Because has a slavery, has different types of slavery occurred in other places of the world? Of course, 100%. Right. Now, the difference is, is that in America, there, one of the main differences was is that the black Americans were stripped of their heritage. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a huge thing to, you know, think about, you know, every other person that's come to America, you know, Irish, Italians, English, whatever it may be, they were able to keep their heritage and who they are. Mm-hmm. Black Americans were stripped of who they were when they came here. When they were brought here. They brought here. Yes. Very clear. They didn't come here on yeah. their own. They didn't. They were brought They here. weren't coming on vacay. They were and brought here. And that's, Big thing. You were stripped of even just your name. Your name. Yeah. Which, you know, I read something. um, I'll I'll have to try to find the article. But, you know, there's so many like, yes, in the black community, there are some names like first names where people are like, what? Why would you name your child that? Right. And like, we've all laughed about it. We've all joked about it. We all know the examples. I was a you know public school teacher for seven years. I've had my share of names where I'm like, why would your mama name you that? Right. But I read this article that offered a really interesting perspective, which was what you just said. Right. We were stripped of our names. Yeah. We did not have our own identities. We were ripped away from our family members. And being able to name your child what you want to name them is important because in our history, that did not occur, right? You, Yes, like you could call your child what you wanted to, but that child may have been stripped away from you. That child may be called something different by quote unquote, their owners. Right. So even something as simple as a name is really critical when you look at where we are now. And it's like not to go too deep because we do really want to focus on, you know, the racial wealth gap here. But the way that um, slavery worked in America was very, very, very distinct. The main focus was to break the mind and soul but preserve the body for work. Mm -hmm. So you have 250 years 
you know, several generations of that mind and soul being broken while still trying to just make sure that the body still works. Mm -hmm. So you got to think about how, from a psychological standpoint, how much of a detriment that was, because, you know, some of these, you know, plantations, you know, the slaves outnumbered the uh, white owners, you know, you'd have like 50 slaves to one owner. Right. So think about what has to be done from a psychological standpoint to break these people that they decide to still be obedient, even though they vastly outnumber right. their owner. Yeah. So it's a very, it's a very interesting and you, it's very, it's, it's just, it's people it's think that psych- it's, it's very like complex. Psychological warfare. Yes, it's a very complex issue. Yes. Yeah. So to think that, you know, that, that, that there's no remnants of that, that doesn't still exist today mm-hmm. is, is, is silly. Well, you know what the other thing, and again, not to veer too far that I always think is interesting is how you, when you, when you're doing this research, you see how much faith slaves had right and you see it like they had their bibles they had their hymnals they had this is also part of the conditioning because christianity was not something they had back home this was taught to them here right but so that i think that is very much part of like god wanted it to be this way you know at At the time period yes that's was very much preached that slaves this was god's will you know there are all different types of um exploitation and mutation of whatever faith you know whatever Mm -hmm. religion or faith you may have and this is a prime example of that yeah a hundred percent all right let's go into so kind of going back to the racial wealth gap okay (laughs) so (laughs) i'm like where did we stop (laughs) so the biggest thing is that like you know once you start to acquire some wealth if you continue that generation by generation that's just exponential growth that's Mm -hmm. compound interest works the same way when it comes to land just continued wealth growth and growth so if you're never able to even start it you are just missing out each generation and generation just Mm -hmm. sending you further and further back yeah all right yeah so now let's go ahead and fast forward to the 1930s. Okay. So what we're dealing with now, this time period, is that we are dealing with post the Great Depression. Okay. All right. So in order to help get us past the Great Depression, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt at the time signed through what's called the New Deal. It was a series of programs enacted to help the U.S. recover from the Great Depression. One of the main programs being access to mortgage credit for a much larger portion of the population. Mm -hmm. Now, when I mean portion of the population, I don't mean blacks. I mean, this was more or less targeted towards white individuals. Mm -hmm. So once again, even though blacks were affected by the Great Depression, they were not part of the program that would help those individuals who were affected. All right. Mm -hmm. So with the um, signing of the New Deal, the uh, Federal Housing Administration was also created. And what ended up happening was, is that they actually wouldn't insure mortgages in areas that were considered, quote unquote, risky. A.K.A. had black people. Correct. How was this determined? It was based upon the racial population of that area. Yeah. So essentially. Talk about a huge discrimination factor. Yes. So essentially what ended up happening was is that the uh Federal Housing Administration was would draw um drew maps showing where they would and wouldn't insure loans. Mm-hmm. Now the areas that they considered risky and where they wouldn't insure loans were actually colored in red. And these areas were highly populated by black individuals and this is where the term redlining came from it was actually coined by a sociologist by the name of uh, john mcknight in the 60s and it was basically because it described the areas that were marked racial and ethnic minority neighborhoods in red and as as hazardous yeah they were seen as hazardous that's insane like like a chemical spill is hazardous yeah and the sad part was is that this was purely based off of race. This mm-hmm. wasn't based off of their um, financial well-being. You know, from a qualification standpoint for the mortgages, they were on par. The only discriminating factor was the color of their They were skin. black. That is so wild. Um, fun fact, Brandon is a huge history buff, and I always love to see him, like, nerd out about <laughs> just history in general. But also, I think it's really interesting, you know, like, now we know where the term redlining came from because we've all heard these terms 40 acres and a mule redlining but like where did they actually come from he actually shared with me that the term knocked up recently because you know again we have these conversations all the time and i had no idea came from if a black 
slave, a female black slave, was pregnant, well, guess what? You're getting another slave in a couple months, so you can knock up the price. Correct. And that's where that term comes from. Yes. And so just even us doing this kind of research, I know I've just learned a ton. I'm connecting the dots more, connecting the timeline in a more clean fashion. Um, and it's just, you know, we need to know more of where we come from. Now we have two small brown children in this world. We want them to know the truth and the history. And obviously we'll be teaching it to them in age appropriate ways, but it's just so important to us to know where we came from, how we got here and make sure that our children know the same. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest issues is, as I said before, that we're not taught this. Right. So nobody knows what they just know that a problem, you know, there is a problem now, Mm -hmm. but they don't know what led to it. And that's a huge issue in regards to being able to conceptualize, you know, everything that has been entailed to that problem and then maybe ways to go about fixing it. Well, and I think, too, I mean, all of this leads into the systemic issues that we still see today yeah. in so many facets of life. And so when people don't understand where these systems, because they are systems that have been put in place, how they are still oppressing brown people today, when you don't understand the history, that's when you hear the comments of, well, they just need to get over it. Or, you know, the things are getting, oh, you're being dramatic, or that was so long ago, or, you know, um, affirmative action, you know, is, is what made me not get the job that I applied for because people don't understand the history. They don't understand why certain programs are in place to help give Brown people opportunities, right? Not give them jobs, speaking of affirmative action, but give them the opportunity to at least interview for the job. Right. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's so many things that have occurred that, you know, that have led to this, you know, current racial wealth gap. So, you know, with the uh, creation of the FHA and access to mortgages for, you know, middle America, Mm -hmm. middle white America, that is really what led to the actual middle class being created. Mm -hmm. Because prior to this, it was either basically you were either poor or you were wealthy. There really wasn't much of an in-between. Right. And with this program, you have now a new middle class that has emerged. And that middle class is predominantly white individuals because they have access to the government programs that helped and black people were left out. So, you know, you know, these policies, you know, ended up, you know, with black residents, they were forced to either take on, um, housing contracts that were just terrible from a call yeah. standpoint. I mean, you even for anyone that has a mortgage now, they know that like, you know, once you have a certain amount of equity within your mortgage, even though your house isn't paid off, you could tap into the equity of this. Mm-hmm. And that's often how people end up purchasing multiple. rental homes and multiple properties. They tap into the equity of their other homes. However, the types of mortgages that were only available to black individuals, this was not an option. They weren't able to tap into the equity of their home until they literally paid off the entire home. Right. Well, and I mean, the in, their interest rates were ridiculous, astronom- astronomical. I mean, just the terms and conditions of black mortgages that were given. I mean, or, it was would be illegal now. It's, yes. A hundred percent illegal because they were trash mortgages that literally bound them to your point to that mortgage indefinitely. Right. Until it was mm-hmm. completely paid off with any out with with no access to taking advantage of the benefits of having a mortgage and an increased home value. And this also led to black families and individuals being pushed into less than idea urban housing projects. Right. Because Which they affects schooling. Correct, uh, yep. I mean, they were they weren't able to afford or were allowed to live in these uh in the in the suburb communities. Right. The more so they affluent. were yes, the more affluent. So they were in areas where, you know, you have Last, less access to, you know, better schooling, which mm-hmm. obviously is a direct correlation to increased wealth. Mm-hmm. You also have less access to just resources in general. So, right. you know, the jobs that were maybe available to you in addition to um, probably grocery stores, food, stuff of that nature, yeah. just continued issues all off of the, you know, the a b- lack of ability to have access to a mortgage at this um, in a fair manner as their white counterpart. Yeah. So. 
this discrimination was, you know, legal at the time, essentially. But, you know, in the late 60s, on paper, quote unquote, this had ended. So in the 1970s, you actually did see an increase in home ownership for black individuals. Um, and, you know, in the 70s it was approximately around almost 63 percent of white families, you know, was home ownership um, in comparison to 41.6 percent for black families. All right. OK, so still, I mean, 20 percent gap. Correct. But some things were changing now that, you know, quote unquote, that discrimination on paper was illegal. Yeah. All right. So now we go ahead and fast forward, you know, into the 90s and, you know, black people were, um, you know, starting to increase their home ownership. Okay. You know, black people really just wanted equality. They didn't, weren't asking at this time for anything in addition. They no just reparations. wanted to have access to the same mortgages mm-hmm. that would be given to their white counterparts. Yeah. All right. Now, however... Let's talk about, you know, 2007, 2008 housing crisis and what actually caused that. All right. So fast forwarding to the housing crisis that occurred in the 2000, 2008, uh, 2007, 2008. So what ended up happening was, is that individuals were receiving a subprime mortgage loans. Now, a subprime mortgage loan is a loan that starts out cheap. However, it gets way more expensive over the years, especially for individuals with lower um, credit scores. So you feel like you're getting a good deal. Correct. But then you're getting screwed. And if you if you are a homeowner, if you've ever sat in a lawyer's office to sign away your life for your mortgage, it's a lot. I mean, it is so much paperwork, so many signatures. And if you don't know what you're reading and you're signing it, I mean, it can really screw you. Yes. So... You and think a lot of, that you sa- it sounds good for what year year one year two maybe year three, and then your mortgage just gets more and more expensive. And especially if you are a you know maybe you're not as educated mm-hmm. as you know the individual you know you're speaking with, and then also you have a certain amount of trust that you're probably giving this person right. and that they're that trying to do the best for is you. Not really guiding you and being ethical and being transparent because even with our current um, home, our most recent home purchase. There were options because we ended up locking it at a 6.5% interest rate coming off of a 2.65, right? That was very painful. But we had an option to do basically like, you know, year one is at 4.8%. Year two is at this percentage. Year three is at this percentage. We know that we're going to be refinancing as quickly as possible anyways. So to us, that didn't make sense. But it sounds very similar, right? Where it's like, this isn't the same. But as far as like the structuring of the loan, it's just getting more and more expensive year over year. Yes. Yeah. But if you don't know that and you're signing your life away, that's where you end up getting screwed. Yeah. I wouldn't compare the same because some, you can't give like 2008 okay. yes. ended up. Okay. Like, so there was a lot of other, there was other factors Illegal in there. Things. So I would not, that's not an apples to apples. And I want to make that okay. kind of clear. Okay. I was trying to make a comparison. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, cause some, you can't give subprime mortgages anymore. It's yeah. illegal. Okay. Okay. So what ended up happening was, is that with these subprime mortgages, black um, loan applicants were twice as likely to be given these mortgage, these uh, subprime mortgages. Mm -hmm. Now, where the problem lies also is that one in five black borrowers who had good credit, who qualified for a regular loan, Mm -hmm. were still being given subprime Subprime. mortgages Wow, because they were black. Mm. So 6.2% of white... Yeah. So borrowers. you have yeah. So some white. I mean, now I'm not going to completely say that this was all just black people. You know, obviously white people were getting um, the white population was getting subprime mortgages as well and had issues and but had lost, but percentage. a much lower percentage. So yeah. you know, uh, white borrowers who had good credit who would have qualified for a regular loan. You know, six about six point two percent of them were receiving subprime um, mortgages, even though they qualified for a regular one. In comparison to twenty one point four percent. For yeah. black. So um, almost four times correct. as m- many black people were getting these yeah. terrible mortgages. And one of the biggest, you know, players in this was Wells Fargo. And unfortunately, dun, dun, dun. Wells Fargo was targeting black churches and they were holding wealth building seminars within these churches. Wells Fargo, listen, aren't they being <laughs> sued right now? Because they're always being sued. Y'all need to not be banking with Wells Fargo. They're all, I personally don't bank with Wells don't Fargo. Don't bank with Wells Fargo. Um, you heard it here first. They they are constantly doing being, shady being sued. things, but um, taking advantage of people. 
what ended up happening was they were holding these uh, quote unquote black wealth building seminars at black churches and they were actually giving kickbacks in the sense of donations to these churches for individuals from the church if they were to apply for and get a home loan. Why do so many corrupt a things happen like at, in churches? I, I I think it's because it's a place where people want to feel safe and then feel they safe pray and on they, they want to feel safe and they also are trusting in these areas yeah. and they unfortunately apply their own goodwill and trust to mm-hmm. other individuals that aren't worthy maybe of that trust. It's the perfect place to take advantage of people. Unfortunately it is. Hmm. And it often happens. Stay woke y'all. Stay woke. I'm not going to talk about somebody else who I feel does the same thing because <laughs> that's not part of this episode. Not part of this one. But you know that's what ended up really leading to the 2008 uh, housing crisis is that you have these subprime loans that were given out and then they start to increase in the amount that's owed and the individuals couldn't pay them. Yeah. And so then, therefore their house goes in foreclosure. Yeah. So it like, and it, then you lose your house, you lose your which house. again, we already now know is where the majority of people hold their wealth. Yeah. So now you've lost your wealth. And the crazy part is that you have the government who had all these bailouts for the banks, you know, as far as bailing them out. But there wasn't a program to bail out America as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, all the people we that were preyed upon. And that's sad. And what ended up happening was, is that the biggest, pe- the largest demographic of people that were affected by this were black families. Mm-hmm. And so the um, median household net worth for black families dropped 53% as a direct result of the 2008 housing crisis. That is wild. So any of the, you know, progress that was made is had been completely away. washed away. Yeah. 53%. Yes. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, you know, we obviously make a good income. We are obviously working on increasing our wealth and building our wealth and becoming work optional and all of these things. But we fully recognize that we have been able to do what we've done because we have been homeowners for a long time now, all things considered. And we're very fortunate in in how we came to that. Yeah. And our, you know, our parents are homeowners. Our parents have been able to help us put down, um, like on our first home when we were younger, help with the initial down payment. Down payment. Why? Well, I, I like could not think of that word. I was like, uh, yeah. I mean, put down you know down payments to get us conventional loans. I mean, we understand that that is such a blessing, and that's obviously something that we plan on doing for our children when they want to own real estate. And that's where the wealth accumulation comes from. You're building upon what the previous generation has done. So, you know, you have one generation has made a certain amount of progress. And the idea is that they help the next generation so that the next generation is not starting at zero. Exactly. And unfortunately, within the black community, that is what tends to happen. Each generation is starting at zero. Yeah. But then we also we've talked about it in, in past episodes, right, where we've talked about life insurance and protection products and how there are some people that are like, well, you know, I worked hard for this. I'm going to spend it. I don't need to leave anything for my my family. But then we also have to account for the you know massive amount of distrust towards the America as a whole industry. and the finance industry as a whole. Yes. And then even more so for black people, because, you know, just on the yeah. life insurance aspect, there were times that insurance companies in general, just not life insurance, insurance mm-hmm. companies in general would not pay out to black uh, policyholders right. for scenarios where they should be paying out. Again, so there another, is that distrust. Yeah, another because, and it comes from a place example. of of fact. Right. Yeah, and it's hard to break that year over year. You hear those things, right? Like, oh, so and so did this, and they lost all their money, and they'd been paying into it. And it's like, yeah. well, you hear the story once, you hear it twice, you hear it three times. Why should I trust? This new person coming around saying that my family needs yes. life insurance or any other insurance. And it comes from a you know it comes from a place. It comes from a valid place. Yes. A hundred percent. You know, a hundred percent. So like, you know, um, the sad part is, is that, you know, you have all these things that are occurring that have occurred and they're still even occurring. You know, there are still, you know, effects of discriminatory lending practices that still linger, even though, quote unquote, it is illegal. Mm -hmm. You know, people of color, you know, more specifically black people are still facing, you know, higher interest rates and lower loan approval rates, even though on paper, they are qualified mm-hmm. the same way that the white counterpart is. Yeah. And so that's an issue. And so we were kind of getting ready to you know, talk about it a little bit earlier. But like when we were talking about um, home appraisal values, mm-hmm. a lot of people are like, oh, you know, everything's fine now. People think that like, unfortunately, I think people think that like slavery ended and everything was just equality just started the next day. 
Right. <laughs> right. Like open your eyes. It's still a dumpster fire, guys. So like, you know, just recently you have a case um last year in Maryland where a uh, John Hopkins a John Hopkins uh professor by the name of Dr. Nathan Connolly and his wife, um, Shawnee Mott in Maryland, they're currently suing um, an appraisal company, a mortgage lender, for a discriminatory uh, appraisal value. Yeah. And this was all over the news. So, yes. again, unless you live under a rock, this should sound familiar to you because it was such a huge case yeah. and I- so eye opening to. What is still happening in America today? Yeah. So essentially, uh, Dr. Connolly was um, with the recent increases in home values. You know, they lived in a prestigious neighborhood in Maryland and they were they had already done a few renovations, but they were looking to just simply do a refinance. Mm -hmm. And so they applied for a refinance, had um, an appraiser come out. And drastically undervalued their home. So for like less than. Yes. I so mean, the first appraisal came back at um, a value of four hundred seventy-two thousand mm-hmm. dollars of what they was. So based upon the appraisal value, they were actually declined the refinance loan. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Now they, uh, Dr. Connolly, was very well aware of you know discriminatory, discriminatory uh, appraisal and lending practices because of what he does for a living. Mm-hmm. And so what he ended up doing was just an experiment to see what happens. So he waited a few months. And then applied again. However, you know, during the first appraisal, they had everything in their, you know, house. They had pictures of their family and they were actually home during the appraisal. Mm -hmm. Second time around, they cleared their house out of anything to show that they were a black family. They even actually borrowed pictures of a white colleague of his who's also a professor at John Hopkins, borrowed pictures of his family, put it in there and actually had him stand in for them at the house. So this is like at this stage, it is a true experiment. Yes. Right. 100 percent. Made it look as though a white family lives there. Mm-hmm. Now, well, they did the second appraisal. It came back at seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Seven hundred. First appraisal four hundred seventy-two thousand. A few months later, second appraisal seven hundred fifty thousand. Was that a two hundred eighty thousand dollar difference? I mean, depending on where you live and what you're buying, that could be two homes in itself. So when we say that these things occur, they do. Now, I'm not saying that it's, you know, this is the norm, but you never know what scenario that you're going to walk into. So the idea is that if I don't know what type of scenario I'm going to be in, I want to be best prepared as possible. So let me go ahead and make sure that my house shows neutral. Well, and when the data shows that 97 percent of home appraisers are white, the likelihood of you getting a non-white appraiser is very limited, very slim. And again, we know not all white people are racist. We know not all white people have ill intent or are doing things maliciously. But again, with this history that we've now shared, we need to make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success and not setting ourselves up for, oh, a black family lives here. I'm going to appraise this house at $280,000 less than it's And worth. also sometimes, too, like, you know, I think with the word, the word, the word when people hear the word racist, it's so alarming to them. And right. there are several degrees of racism. Like, I'm not talking about you are a Klan member, you have a burning hood hanging a up, burning a cross. Like, that's yard. not what I'm talking about. There are different levels of even just um, unconscious bias that, you know, right. has not even necessarily a fault of your own. It's built into our society because we all have them. Yes. By the racism way. is as American as American pie. Like, yes, racism is ingrained in the DNA of that America. That is how this country was built. Be upset me saying it, but that's the truth. Yes, it is ingrained in our DNA, and it is old as America. So we have a system that, unfortunately, even like you know, conditions us to have these biases, and you don't even know it. You yeah. don't. People may not want to have them, but it happens. And, well, the, and, and the we is, all have yeah. unconscious bias based on. Our upbringing, our lived experiences, where, you know, where we live, how we live, what we've been exposed to. I mean, I even had like a moment the other day. There's a lot of construction in our area. And I saw uh, I was driving through where they're building like new townhouses. And I saw a woman come out of one of the buildings with like, you know, the lime green vest on. She had a big old tool belt on, like massive drill in her one hand, some other you know, construction type appliance, not appliance, uh, tool tool (laughs) in the other hand. And I was like, you go girl. It's just not something you see, right? Like, but is your unconscious bias that all construction workers or home builders are male, right? Like it's sometimes it's little things. Yeah. I mean, and with, and it's not, and it's again, not ill intentioned or with malice or we, we sometimes negative. Yeah. Sometimes you can't control where your mind goes, but the key is 
be do aware. you bring yourself back? Right. Like you have this, like, you know, you're out and about and you let's like, just use for a race standpoint, you're a white person, you see a black person and you kind of like lock, oh, your, lock car your car door, door or hold then, your purse but then you're like, closer. But then you're, like, but then you're like, oh, like I shouldn't be doing this. Like this. Mm-hmm. So like you have, you could like having those biases, like those are going to be hard to get rid of. But it's like, do you have the self-awareness to say like, hey, like I had that bias. I shouldn't have it. Right. And then work on it. That's all we're, that's all I'm asking right. for. I had a friend, this was like probably over a year ago at this point, text me. She's a white woman. And she texted me and she said, I was sitting in the parking lot and this black man walked by and I locked my car door. And she's like, does that make me racist? <laughs> and A, I just, you know, I'm so glad that I have the friendships that I have because that that's a moment of vulnerability, right? To be like, hey, I'm aware of this thing that I just did. I'm a white woman sitting in my car. This black guy walked by. I locked my car. Why did I just do that? And does it make me racist, right? And in my head, I was like, no, it doesn't make you racist. Like, no. you're not impacting this person's, you know, next job or their salary or where their kid gets to go to school or you you had a moment. You're a human and you're a woman. This was a man. He walked by. Did you lock your car door because he was a black man? Did you walk lock your car door because you forgot that your car door was unlocked? Like, no. But again, have a conscious moment. Have a moment where you're like, oh, why did I just do that? Am I going to do that again? And I I simply responded no, it doesn't make you racist. I think it's also, I think also people don't have a firm definition of what racism is. Cause yeah, for starters, you got to understand what the actual definition and the entire definition, not part of the definition. Right. One of the biggest parts of the definition that I think people tend to miss is that you think that another race is inferior less to you than. less than based solely off of them being in that race. Right. But also the- you have to think that they are, inferior Mm -hmm. based upon their race. That is a big part of the word racism. Yes. So do you dislike a certain race because you just simply think that they're inferior, the entire group of of them, because they're not your race? Yeah. And then is there a component of the part, the ethnicity or the people in power or the people? Wow. I should have had more coffee today. There's a component of, power and control correct that is exhibited during racist acts yes right so there's a difference between being racist and being prejudiced those are that, there's, yeah there's there's reason, there's, the definitions are people tr- tend to use them interchangeably but they are different yes that's <laughs> words also true. do matter yeah and but again having those conscious moments right and and i was like i lock my car door all the time there are oper- there have been times where i have sat somewhere realized my car door is not locked it just locks her car door i lock listen all the time. i will be in the public <laughs> parking lot haven't seen a black person in 48 hours and my car door is going to be locked okay so i just thought it was a i thought it was a very vulnerable moment and i appreciate my friends that will text me things like that yeah and having the conversations is right big part because the conscious effort is all we're looking for that's what i'm looking for in the people that i'm surrounding i mean myself with it's funny you say that scenario because i can remember an instance that occurred to me that i still like it's ingrained in my mind i was a sophomore in college at the college of charleston in uh charleston south carolina and it's middle of the day I'm going to class now at the time I did have, I mean, I had, I had dreadlocks, I had long dreadlocks, but I was going to class. I had my glasses on I had a college of Charleston, uh, t-shirt on You're clearly a khaki, uh, khaki shorts and like some Adidas flip flops in my backpack. Hmm. And I remember walking to class and I remember an older white lady in front of me who kept pausing and like looking back at me and looking back at me. And then she actually steps to the side, kind of like holding her purse, watching me as I walk by. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, like, did this lady really just think that you were gonna like mug I was her? gonna mug her? And like, yeah. if there are a lot of muggings, but, but, but if anyone's <laughs> familiar, downtown Charleston. but if anyone's familiar with Charleston, South Carolina, we were on King Street, yeah, one of the main streets where. People are walking, busy, busy walking up and down the street. Yeah, yeah. And it was just very odd to me. And it was just one of those moments. It's those moments. The campus is in the middle of downtown yeah. Charleston. So, one like, those, there's college students everywhere. And it's one of those moments of racism where, like, I try to, like, in my mind think, like, is there, like, I'm trying to think of like a thousand different other reasons that this occurred, that it wasn't, you know. Yeah. And we and, don't know her lived experience, right? We don't know. I mean, obviously, you were like, wow, that was a direct 
reflection on how she felt about me. She felt threatened. She felt scared. She thought something might happen. Like I could almost see it in like if we were in a dark area. Right. By ourselves. At night. At night. Yeah. No, it was like 11 o'clock. Yeah. 11 (laughs) a.m. On a a super busy main street. And it was very obvious I was a college student. Yeah. I don't know too many people that that get mugged by guys in flip flops, but. Who knows what her her experiences have been. Maybe she has been mugged by a guy with dreadlocks and a College of Charleston shirt on. We don't know. We know that you're not a criminal. You, we know that you weren't going. I to just laughed. Honestly, at that point in time, I just had to laugh as I walked by because it was just that ridiculous. Yeah. And well, like, and now, you know, now your experience, unfortunately, is, oh, this old white lady was threatened by me and thought that I was a criminal. Right. But the, and the thing, but that also relates to even just like I me, mean, maybe that in part has had an imprint on me because for those who don't know me, you know, personally, you know, I'm six, three. About 245. I'm not a small person. Did you lose five pounds? (laughs) I'm not a small person. And I do understand, you know, the stature that I have and how that can be threatening possibly to someone who doesn't know me. Mm -hmm. But like in that instance, it was very comical to me because. Yeah. You're also a young college student. Yes. It was very obvious. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think I mean, I'm sure the point of all of that was to say we all have different experiences, but you as a black man in America have you have a long list of experiences yeah, that you've I have had. Unfortunately, too many. But you know, that's you know, that's really wasn't the focus of this particular episode. I know we we, <laughs> we kind of veered we again. Veered off. But well, the biggest part to take away from here was is that you know you have, um, you know, from like sixteen nineteen to eighteen sixty five, blacks were slaves. Mm-hmm. That's over. That's almost two hundred fifty years. Yeah, it's a long where time. You, it's a two hundred fifty year, you know, bare minimum. Uh, delay and start. Right. But then you have from like, you know, from 1965 to quote unquote 1968 that you have like legal discrimination. No, 1865. Sorry, sorry. 1865 to 1968 where discrimination was basically legal. Mm-hmm. You know? No, not basically. It, it was. was legal. It was legal. It and was. then, you know, from 1968 to today, you know, even though discrimination is illegal on paper, we all know that these, these, policies and thoughts and feelings about this haven't just gone away. Right. You they still are, have these again, individuals they are ingrained in, yes. in how our country was founded. You still have these individuals in places of power that are still continuing with this discrimination. Right. The easiest way that I kind of think about it is, is that like, you know, to close the racial wealth gap, it's going to be very hard because it's not just a matter of, a, you know, um, wage gap because the wage gap mm-hmm. is much closer Right. Much, much of less of a gap in comparison to the racial wealth gap, but because wealth you could change well, you could change how much people get paid today. Right. That's easy. Yeah. You can't eliminate 300 plus years of no. a head start. You know, think mm-hmm. about you have, you know, a white guy and a black guy in a race and the white guy just now had a 300 year head start. <laughs> Now, in addition to or that, even a 30 minute head start, saying, right? Like if it's a 300 year head start. Yeah. Now, in addition, now the black guy starts running. But you know what they do to his side? Let's throw barriers. Let's throw walls. He has to climb over. Right. Let's put a, a, um, a weight on the let's road. A, let's put a weight on his ankle. Right. <laughs> so uh, you're and then also ocean in the yeah, middle and he can't swim. It's hard because you're not like, for example, you know, the, you know, white, white community, they're not going to just continue. They're not going to just stop their progress and they shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't have to just stop your progress. Right. But they if you don't stop going. your progress, you're never like, you know, that gap yeah. is not going to be uh, closed. Yeah. So it's a very complex problem to solve. Yep. Absolutely. And it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year, but really, you know, the focus of this, conversation was to make those aware of, you know, some of the things that have led up to this. Yeah. So to have a better understanding of how the problem um, occurred. Yeah. Yeah. This is not, you don't need to walk away from this feeling guilty no. or sad or. And this we, isn't victim mentality either. I no, always, no. I've, I've heard like, unfortunately I've had, I try to have these conversations with individuals and some are, some are, some are amazing conversations and other ones are completely not a great conversation and is a waste of my time at the end of the day. Right. But you know, I've had people say that, you know, that's a victim mentality. It's like, bro, I've never in my life considered myself a victim. No, (laughs) this is, we, what we are aware of a problem is not being a victim. We are trying to help inform you from a finance perspective, why the black community is still behind and it's black history month and it's our podcast. So we get to talk about whatever we want. (laughs) So (laughs) hopefully this conversation has been interesting to you, helpful to you. Hopefully it got your wheels turning. Hopefully it's something 
um, that you will continue to explore on your own. We are going to link resources in our show notes that you can dig into. Mm -hmm. One of the ones that I really love and I really encourage you to watch because I like things that are easy for you to digest and don't take much effort Quick. to give you a, a lot of information. Yeah. Once again, uh, the um, series explained on Netflix has so an good. episode um, on the racial wealth gap. Mm-hmm. I think it's 18 minutes max. Mm-hmm. And it does a phenomenal job of explaining the information. I really encourage you to take that, you know, 18 minutes to go ahead and watch that. Yeah. There's another documentary 13th. Yes, that is a much, that's a long, that's, a little bit long, but it's not that long. Yes, I think it's like an hour. But if you're interested yeah, like in hour. learning just about post-slavery times and how black people have been impacted and the things that we have gone through, I say we as a people, obviously, um, that is a phenomenal documentary that I encourage anybody who wants to learn about our history to watch um, an hour, maybe an hour and a half well spent. Yes. So we will link all of these things, please, as always, reach out to us, send us emails, leave us a voicemail, sl- slide into our DMs, ask yes, whatever you need yes. to ask. We are not his- historians. We are not professors of African-American history, um, but we have done research over the years. We do take pride in understanding and I love having genuine open conversation with yes. people. Like we've had friends of ours that have reached out to find out more. I've had like, you know, neighbors in, the, in my neighborhood that, you know, once they, you know, these topics came up, reached out to me and we sat down and had phenomenal conversations. So right. like, I'm not here to make anyone feel bad. I'm not here to jump down your throat. No, I would like, to, I, that's I'm, just not I, us yeah, in general. I welcome open conversation. Yes. Always. Now, granted, your conversation does need to be based in fact. I'm not <laughs> looking to hear your opinions. Your, I, well, no, opinions no, are opinions, fine. Yes. But, but don't present an opinion as a fact. <laughs> yes. That. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, babe, I think this was a fantastic conversation and a great way to kick off our Black History Month series. Hopefully you will stick around. We've got a lot more topics to talk about and we can't wait to hear your feedback on this episode. As always, please rate, review, subscribe, share with friends. It means so much to us and it goes a long way. We'll talk to you soon. Don't forget, Benjamin Franklin said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. You just got paid. Until next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode. We are so glad to have you as part of our Sugar Daddy community. If you learned something today, please share this episode with your friends, family, and extended network. We hope to reach as many people as possible for positive impact. Don't forget to subscribe and connect with us on social media at the Sugar Daddy Podcast. You can also email us questions you want us to answer for our Pass the Sugar segment at the Sugar Daddy Podcast at gmail.com.